a fifth session for this short course, El Niño en las Américas, proteger la salud y promover la resiliencia. Como les había comentado, The Americas Protecting Health and Promoting Resilience. This is a course organized by jointly by some organizations such as PAHO, the WMO, NOAA, the United Nations Office for Disaster Risk Reduction, and the Global Consortium of Climate and Health Education. This is the fifth session, and we're going to deal with vector-borne and zoonotic diseases. I'm going to be your moderator today. I'm Suhel Padilla, and I am a member of the Unit of Climate Change and Health at the Pan American Health Organization. I'm also a part of the STEP program of, for the Inter-American Institute for Global Change Research. This session has simultaneous interpretation available in Spanish and English. You can change to your selected language using the button at the bottom of the page to listen in either English or Spanish. Next, please. This is the fifth session on vector-borne and zoonotic diseases, and we're also would love to have you for the next one that will be on air quality. These sessions last for 90 minutes, and at the end of the session, we will have a Q&A session, please write your questions as they come up in the Q&A um, section below in Zoom materials and the recording will be available in the website within 24 hours. Next, please. In this website, you will also find the slides for this course. I invite you to review the links for the previous sessions and at the maximum uh, within 24 hours. Next, please. Okay, and also in the chat, we will be sharing a document of recommendations prepared by, by PAHO with short-term um, acute recommendations and you can download them from that link. Next, please. Uh, in this session, we have two speakers. I'm going to briefly introduce each of them. Our first speaker is Rachel Lowe. He's an ICREA research professor leading the Global Health Resilience Group at the Barcelona Supercomputing Center. She has published uh, articles on the risk for climate sensitive diseases. And her work has focused on the viability of integrating seasonal climate forecasts in early warning system for infectious diseases. In Latin America, the Caribbean and Southeast Asia, our next speaker, Angel Munoz is a senior researcher at the Barcelona Supercomputing Center. He of focus on the on COVID, on he works on human migration, food security, under nutrition, vector-borne diseases, and lightning activity. We welcome everyone. And now I will give the floor to our first speaker, Rachel, please go ahead. Can you see my screen? 
know thank yet. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for the invitation to contribute to this fascinating course. Um, so today I will be sharing um, some of our research on trying to understand how El Nino and uh, climate variation may impact uh, the outbreaks of vector-borne diseases. Um, so here we can see a graph showing us um, changes in temperature from 1850 through to uh, 2023. And we can see that decade upon decade, the temperature, the global temperatures have been warming dramatically. And particularly in this year, um, up to September last month, we've seen unprecedented and record breaking temperatures. And, and this is partly due to the uh, signal we, we're seeing from, from climate change, but also we have the um, developing El Nino event, which is also contributing to uh, particularly warm temperatures. And this has implications for um, the expansion spread and outbreaks of vector-borne diseases. If we take the example of dengue, um, over the last few decades, we've seen uh, dengue increase from um, impacting around nine countries in the 1970s to over 120 countries and more. We're starting to see emergence and outbreaks in um, places that are previously unaffected, including Europe. And the, the World Health Organization estimates that around half the world's population is now at risk of um, dengue and other uh, diseases transmitted by the Aedes mosquitoes. And modeling studies have shown that um, if we're to continue on a business as usual trajectory, we can expect billions more people to be at risk of these diseases. So it's very important that we can both mitigate the impacts of climate change and also uh, make sure we can develop strong adaptation strategies to be prepared. Um, this here is showing how uh, dengue has been spreading across Brazil. Uh, Brazil is one of the um, countries in the world uh, reporting more cases of dengue than anywhere else. Um, we can see in the first decade of this century, um, the distribution of uh, the municipalities across Brazil experiencing um, outbreaks of dengue. And we can see um, these circles are showing areas in the south of Brazil and the Amazon where we had protected areas. So these are either protected due to cool temperatures or perhaps being more remote areas. But in um, if we... Uh, assess this data up to 2020, we can see that dengue has been spreading gradually south in the country and also into the Amazon rainforest. And uh, studies have shown that this is partly due to uh, warming temperatures, particularly in the south, which is allowing uh, the mosquitoes to be able to um, survive uh, for longer periods of the year and to be able to transmit the disease. And also we're seeing increasing um, infrastructure, allowing more connectivity between those areas in Brazil that experience explosive um, epidemics and the more um, smaller um, cities in the Amazon rainforest. Also in Europe, um, these unprecedented warming temperatures are allowing um, the Aedes albopictus mosquito, which is prevalent in many countries across Europe, um, to survive uh, for longer periods. Uh, we recently published a commentary with colleagues in Greece who have found for the first time um, a large number of adult Aedes albopictus mosquitoes surviving over winter. And this coincided with the warmest ever recorded temperatures there. Um, so this is a real concern about how um, the warming temperatures and changing climatic patterns are impacting um, the potential for transmission of these diseases in new places. Uh, last year, we published a scoping review assessing the evidence of outbreaks of extreme climatic events in the aftermath of uh, um, infectious diseases in the aftermath of extreme climatic events. Uh, so, for example, reports of diseases like dengue, malaria, diarrheal diseases and cholera uh, following episodes of um, cyclones or droughts or flooding. And interesting, we found there was uh, a fair bit of evidence documenting outbreaks of waterborne diseases like diarrheal diseases and cholera. Um, not so many links between uh, extremes and um, malaria and some emerging evidence about the impacts of things like droughts and, and, and extreme rainfall on dengue. And I'll talk about some of those studies as we go through. So um, just as a reminder, I know this has been covered a lot in this course, just often when we're trying to understand the impacts of El Nino on infectious diseases, we want to understand how um, historical changes in the sea surface temperatures may have um, 
been associated with outbreaks of these diseases. Um, so this is just giving us a reminder of the different areas of the Pacific Ocean where we can monitor the anomalies in the sea surface temperature and remind ourselves as when we've experienced these large El Nino events, for example, um, in 98, um, and also uh, 2015 to 16, um, and this year uh, we are seeing. This is the um, projection. This is a, a forecast from ECMWF uh, showing um, a plume uh, for um, anomaly plume for the Nino 3.4. And we can see that according to this, we would expect um, the sea surface temperatures in the Pacific Ocean in the Nino 3.4 region to peak um, in somewhere between uh, December and uh, February. And this uh, has implications for impacting the climate across the globe in different ways and at different uh, lead times. So for example, when we see uh, warming of the sea surface temperatures, this tends to be associated with particularly warm conditions in different parts of the globe. So here we're looking at the correlation between December, January, February, um, um, sea surface temperatures when these El Nino events tend to peak. And um, this is looking at uh, temperature um, across the globe. So we can see that particularly when El Nino peaks, we can see warming, for example, in the north of um, uh, South America, particularly along the coastal areas. And then that tends to drop off as you go through the season. And also for precipitation, we actually tend to see, for example, if we focus on um, South America, we can see in southern Brazil, northern Argentina, we tend to see um, exceptionally uh, wet conditions during El Nino events, which can often lead to flooding. Whereas in the north of uh, Brazil and um, northern South America, we tend to see more dry conditions. Uh, so this has implications for how we may use this kind of information to try and understand uh, the risk of outbreaks of, of infectious diseases. So this is um, an image of uh, the supercomputer that we have at the Barcelona Supercomputing Center. Um, I joined uh, the institution uh, last year and established the Global Health Resilience Group. Um, and we work alongside the Earth System Services Group um, to incorporate uh, climate information, including forecasts and projections into uh, decision support systems uh, to provide information for public health decision makers, particularly to build resilience against climate sensitive infectious diseases. Mm -hmm. And we work across uh, several different spatial domains, time horizons and disciplines. So for example, um, we develop indicators at the global level to try and understand um, how uh, the climate has been impacting health over the last few decades. Uh, we also work with um, ministries of health and environment agencies at both regional and national level, trying to um, incorporate uh, forecasts into early warning systems. And we're also working with local decision makers to see how we can uh, incorporate um, finer scale data, both for environmental monitoring and disease surveillance data uh, from, say, weather sensors and drones to really understand these fine scale um, processes and how they can impact um, disease risk. And we're also working to try and incorporate these um, concepts of risk that are used by the IPCC in terms of measuring risk in terms of hazard exposure and vulnerability with the One Health approach to understanding um, how the environment, um, human and animal health all interact to um, impact um, the health of the planet and people. Um, so this is just a snapshot of some of the um, different projects we're working on in the Global Health Resilience Group. So we've been working on incorporating different data streams, including Earth observations, uh, disease surveillance data and seasonal forecasts into um, Bayesian statistical models to make probabilistic forecasts about um, dengue. Um, we've had some particular success at doing this, for example, in Vietnam. Um, we also have projects looking at harmonize um, different data types um, to be able to build the, a robust evidence base so we can uh, develop early warning systems and um, health vulnerability assessments. Uh, we have been developing uh, modeling tools to be able to understand the compound impact of extreme climatic events. So for example, if we're in an area where we're experiencing a drought and then a flood, um, how might this impact um, the risk of different kinds of um, infectious diseases? And we're currently leading um, the Lancet countdown uh, for Europe 
uh, which tracks the impacts of climate change on health and the co-benefits of climate action um, to try and uh, make policy makers aware of the urgent need to develop tools to uh, mitigate the impacts of climate change for health. And we, uh, our goal is to try and in, um, translate all this information that's available off, at our fingertips from satellites, from gridded products, um, from forecasting models, and trying to translate this into indicators that are useful and actionable on the ground, which can help pinpoint uh, interventions um, such as mosquito control or educational campaigns uh, with some uh, lead time. So I'm just going to explain about some of the work that we've done over the last few years um, in collaboration with my colleague, Dr. Anna Stuart Ibarra and other collaborators and trying to understand the impacts of El Nino on uh, dengue in Ecuador. Uh, so this is an example, uh, this is an image to show um, the extreme flooding that was experienced in the southern coastal city of Machala. Uh, this was in February 2016, and this was one of the worst flooding events that had been experienced in the city since the previous El Nino event in uh, 1998. And this, of course, has implications for the transmission of many different vector and um, vector-borne zoonotic diseases. Uh, so we were working with um, partners in um, Ecuador to uh, collate the different uh, disease surveillance data for uh, dengue cases um, from 2002 through to 2015 with the meteorological station data um, to monitor changes in precipitation and temperature. Um, and also we compared this to the um, Oceanic uh, Nino Index um, and we could see some general patterns. Uh, like when we get El Nino, we tend to see warmer and wetter conditions. Um, and this tends to be associated with outbreaks of infectious diseases. So we combine this information into a um, Bayesian hierarchical model, which also accounted for um, seasonality and intraannual variation that could be attributed to other non-climatic factors. And then um, we combined um, this model with different data streams to try and predict the evolution of the dengue season in 2016. So this is just showing us um, what's known as the endemic channel. So this is just the mean and upper 95% confidence interval of the historic dengue cases for the five years uh, prior to the year that we were trying to um, forecast. So if we were to rely on current practice, then we would expect um, in 2016 to have seen a peak in dengue um, in around uh, June. And then using a um, climate informed dengue prediction model, um, we uh, predicted a slightly earlier peak in March um, with an 85% chance of exceeding uh, the 95th uh, um, upper confidence interval over the previous five years. And then after the event, um, we compared this with what the data was actually observed and we could see that there was in fact um, an earlier peak this year. Um, so that what helped us uh, be able to produce this prediction was first of all using an ensemble of um, seasonal climate forecasts for both precipitation and temperature. We can see here that um, this year that the most of the ensemble members uh, were able to pick up this exceptionally um, wet event that happened in February, which coincided with the, the flooding of, um, event image that I showed you. Um, we can see here the dashed uh, black line is showing the actual observed precipitation that was measured in um, the city of Machala. And also uh, temperature was um, also predicted to be um, higher than usual. So this helped us predict uh, the timing of the peak and also the magnitude of the um, of the uh, dengue event uh, was improved because we were able to incorporate some data from an active, active surveillance study that was conducted, which actually found that in the previous year, around 70% of the dengue cases that had been reported were in fact um, chikungunya. So this also had slightly distorted the endemic channel. Um, so this information also helped us more accurately um, capture the magnitude. Um, and another interesting aspect of this study um, was uh, uh, the way that we were trying to um, align the seasonal climate forecast information with our meteorological station data. Um, because if we were to take the forecast from the grid square in which um, the city and the meteorological stations are included, then we would have been um, 
predicting temperatures that are uh, systematically cooler than the ones are actually experienced in the city. Um, so in this study, it made sense to use uh, data from a grid square just next to the city over the ocean because this was more aligned. So this is a very sort of simplistic form of uh, bias correction. We've also been uh, working with colleagues in Argentina to understand how El Nino and flooding events are associated with um, leptospirosis outbreaks. Um, so we published a study um, this year where we uh, were developing a two-stage approach um, where we were making um, initial uh, outbreak predictions First of all, just using the El Nino indicator and the, um, the lags that we found between um, these anomalous sea surface temperatures associated with um, uh, El Nino and Lepto outbreaks. Yeah. So in a first stage model, um, using the El Nino indicator alone and accounting for the um, seasonality and intraannual variation, um, if we were to have made a prediction in December for March, uh, we would have found an, um, a probability of an 84% um, increase in the risk of lepto outbreaks. And then two months later, if we make a, a subsequent prediction using uh, precipitation and river height, um, then this probability outbreak um, would have been updated to um, 89%. So this framework is um, particularly useful in a setting where rather than having to fall back on using um, forecast information, we can use the lags in the system to provide, provide these um, early indicators. Um, I'm going to talk now uh, a little bit about some of the work that we've been um, developing over the years in the Caribbean, uh, working with partners at the Caribbean Institute for Meteorology and Hydrology and the Caribbean Public Health Agency, um, to uh, try and understand how we can um, better use climate information to um, provide climate services for health. Um, here um, we are looking at um, the dengue incidence rate that was observed in Barbados from 1999 to um, 2016 and comparing this with the uh, standardized precipitation index which can um, tell us about the uh, severity of either drought events or exceptionally wet conditions um, where negative uh, values are indicative of drought and positive values are indicative of extremely wet conditions and also we found that um, it's well known that in the Caribbean and Barbados, um, the standards, the drought conditions are very much linked to El Nino events. So when we have these strong El Nino events, we also tend to see exceptionally um, dry conditions. And it had been noted by our partners in the um, in Barbados that the, um, the changes in the uh, dengue epidemiology, and they were starting to see outbreaks of uh, dengue potentially associated with drought conditions. And they thought that this might be due to the recommendation to store water during drought conditions, which might be leading to an increase in mosquito breeding sites. So we extended the approach that we had developed in Ecuador um, to try and understand the delayed and nonlinear impacts of um, both the, the drought indicator and temperature. Mm -hmm. And we found this interesting patterns where um, several months after drought um, events, we saw an increased risk of dengue outbreaks, but also immediately after exceptionally wet conditions. And in terms of temperature, we found um, what you would expect from the literature that several months after particularly warm uh, conditions, we found an increased risk of dengue. So we combined all this information into a model and um, using out of sample predictions, uh, we had a look at how well uh, this model could have predicted um, the probability of an outbreak. So here we're just looking at um, the, the shading color is telling us the probability of an outbreak according to our model. So the stronger the color of uh, purple, the more probable it would have been. And then the X's are marking if an outbreak actually occurred. So the outbreak is defined as exceeding um, the 75th percentile of the historical distribution for any given month. Um, and we decided that uh, um, with the, our partners in Barbados that we would trigger an alert if that probability exceeded um, 30%. Um, so that was based on a, um, a, a separate rock analysis. So here we can see how this model um, compared to a baseline model. So the baseline model is um, including just a term to account for that um, seasonality um, alone. Um, so we can see that the, um, the climate informed model produced more hits and less false alarms compared to this um, baseline model. 
And these findings um, were at least in a qualitative way incorporated into the Caribbean Health Climatic Bulletin. So during a drought event that was ex observed in 2020, followed by a forecast for exceptionally wet and um, warm conditions, then um, a, a warning was um, provided about being aware of um, trying to eliminate mosquito breeding sites. Okay, um, we've also been developing a body of work uh, trying to understand how we can incorporate uh, climatic information and socioeconomic indicators into dengue early warning systems in Brazil. Um, so uh, following on from our, our work in Barbados, we we're really interested to see if this um, association between droughts and dengue might also hold in a larger um, geographical area. So here we're looking at the um, dengue instance rate across the whole of Brazil. We can see over there's over 3 million cases of dengue uh, reported over a 20 year period between 2000 and 2020. And we compared this to uh, here we were using the Palmer Drought Severity Index. Um, and we can see that over the last few years, we've seen particularly um, severe drought conditions in the north and northeast of the country in, um, in later years. And um, we were very interested to find a very similar pattern where um, around uh, three to five months following drought events, we saw this increased risk of dengue in um, Brazil and also immediately after exceptionally wet conditions. And we wanted to know how this would interact with the um, underlying uh, landscape. So we uh, looked at how these patterns changed according to if you were in a particularly urbanized area, or also areas with increased um, water shortage reports. And we found that this drought effect was in fact uh, um, exacerbated in the urban areas, whereas the exceptionally wet um, um, conditions were exacerbated in the more rural areas. So this has um, implications for designing um, early warning systems in depending on if you're operating in an urban via rural setting and uh, thinking about which indicators are most important depending on your setting. And this is some work that we're developing um, with the Red Cross. And again, it's important um, to think about when uh, seasonal climate forecasts may be able to offer uh, more skill and uh, more useful information. So we know that uh, seasonal climate forecasts tend to be more skillful when we have uh, these El Nino events, and that can help us um, inform our models depending on where we are. Here we just uh, see we can see across Brazil uh, that when we do tend to get El Nino events, that is more associated with droughts. Whereas in the um, south of Brazil and also in northern Argentina, um, the El Nino events are more associated with exceptionally wet conditions and flooding. So again, we must take this into consideration when we're developing um, disease-specific models in um, different geographical locations. So of course, all these models depend on the kind of information that you are inputting into them. And so we're currently working on a project to harmonize multi-source, multi-scale data um, with stakeholders operating in different um, areas in Latin America and the Caribbean. Um, so we're working with partners in Brazil, the Dominican Republic, um, Peru and Colombia to try and develop um, toolkits to gather uh, different kinds of data from satellite images, um, gridded climate reanalysis and forecasts, and to be able to integrate this with strategically collected data from drones and weather sensors, along with surveillance data from socioeconomic, demographic and health system indicators and disease surveillance data. So in particular hotspots, for example, in cities, the Amazon rainforest, small islands and highlands, we can build uh, tools that can help address the problems that are particularly prominent in those areas. So if you'd like to learn more about this project, we now have um, our website, which is um, live, um, and we have several uh, news stories and information about our different partners and projects. So please um, do visit the website. And um, we also have a, a new project called ID Extremes, where we're working to develop um, modeling tools uh, to try and um, incorporate different climatic indicators and develop these impact-based forecasting tools for health and uh, taking advantage um, of the current infrastructure that exists at the Barcelona Supercomputing Center. Uh, we're building um, an R package tool um, that will sit alongside the suite of other tools that have been developed by the Earth Sciences Department to um, process climate indicators, to be able to verify climatic information, 
And then our tool will help use this um, verified and bias corrected information to provide useful probabilistic outputs for um, infectious diseases in partnership with um, users in different countries. We're particularly working with um, the, um, the Barbados Meteorological Service, the InfoDengue platform in Brazil, and we're also working with the Red Cross and MSF to try and incorporate this kind of information into their um, dashboards and user interfaces um, with different partners in Africa and Southeast Asia. And um, taking advantage of the current emerging system uh, um, situation with El Nino and um, demand from our partners in several countries across Latin America and the Caribbean, we're currently uh, developing um, a series of um, models to try and estimate the probability of outbreaks given um, different combination of climatic indicators using a combination of observed and forecast variables mm -hmm. um, for a range of different countries. So we're particularly focusing on um, Barbados, Ecuador um, and Northern Argentina in the first instance and um, to try and develop a, a forecasting scheme where um, in a given month we can make um, probabilistic predictions from one to six months in advance using different combinations of observed and forecast information. Um, and we hope to be able to share these um, forecasts and, and updates with our partners and um, the community in the next few months. So please watch this space. Um, we're also in the Global Health Resilience team and the Data and Diagnostics team uh, looking for um, a postdoctoral researcher and a software engineer to help us um, develop these different projects. So please, if you're interested in, in joining us, please do get in touch. Um, and if you'd like to hear more about some of our projects, um, there's a short video that was produced a couple of years ago by the Royal Society, which includes some interviews with some of our partners in these different hotspots. And I'll be very happy to pa pass over to my partner, Angel, who will be um, giving the next talk. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Rachel, and hello, everyone. Uh, should I, are there any questions for Rachel before I start or on how, sorry that I arrive a few minutes late and I don't know if this was discussed. <laughs> hola, 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 buenos dias. ¿Qué tal? Buen día. Sí, bueno, primero agradecerle a Rachel por su presentación. Gracias, muy informativo y muy remarcable lo de las tempranas. Todas las personas para hacer un pronóstico de enfermedades zoonóticas y por de vectores. Las preguntas se realizarán al final de la sesión. Entonces, les daremos paso a segundo paso. Por favor, adelante, Ángel. Perfecto. Gracias. ¿Puedes verlo en la pantalla? Perfecto. So it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you very much for the opportunity. So I'm going to show a few slides, and then I think that the best is to actually try the tool, a live demo, so we can, I don't know, I'm going to ask you to mention a location, and then we will take a look at what this tool can do, okay? So um, I'm going to be talking about AEDES. Uh, you will, you will. well, I think that you all know what AEDES is in terms of a species, uh, but um, this is a, a climate and health uh, service that we had been building for years with PAHO and many, many others. You will see uh, them in, in a second. So the outline of my talk is, um, I'm gonna talk a little bit about context, about the this demand-driven approach, which is so essential when we want to do climate services. And then I'm gonna introduce the tool and then you know, we will actually play a little bit with it. So, um, you know, this uh, work comes from a long story of collaborations with several partners, in particular with the Pan American Health Organization, the World Health Organization. And uh, originally, um, well, we have been doing prediction for a while and, and, and these uh, partners came and asked us if we were able to say something about the Zika virus, probably, especially people in Latin America who are here uh, in, in, in this call right now will remember that this was a big thing uh, a few years back. So we actually published that paper on, on seeing if we, were, we could have been forecast 
we could have been able to forecast um, the Zika epidemic. So you will see a little bit why, you know, in a second, why that's so important, because it's through these collaborations with real world decision makers, uh, and how they actually make decisions that defines absolutely everything that we need um, in order to create these uh, type of predictive tools. So, you know, the typical typical common demands questions uh, that we find out there is something like, can we forecast IFS bone diseases? And, you know, this is similar to this question I just mentioned coming from PAHO in terms of, of Zika. And What's going on? Okay. And also, uh, you know, we learned very early that they have protocols in place that tell them what to do depending on particular values, on, on particular thresholds or, of their key variables. So what if I just provide the mean or the or the expected median in a particular forecast? You know, it's like they we provide that to them and they compare it to their protocols. And the protocol says if these values succeeded, do this, and if these other values succeeded, do that. And those values in general are not going to agree, are not going to be equal to, to the mean or the median. So we needed to go beyond that, okay? So as you can imagine, um, there are a lot of people leading and involving uh, AIDIS, this uh, beautiful project. I am so happy that this female dominated. So uh, Laura Harrington from Cornell, I was at that time at Columbia University, now the Barcelona Supercomputing Center, Patrick Keeney from University of Boston. I cannot like mention all of them, but uh, in particular, Carmen, uh, Gonzalez Romero now at BSC and Laurel De Serra have been essential for this work, uh, more if you want on the model prediction side of things. And then Anna Rivière Cinemon uh, from PAHO, uh, WHO, and of course, Madeline Thompson, Welcome Trust. So it's a, it's a lot of people and a lot of institutions that I am mentioning here we got uh, also funding from uh, NOAA to do this, this system. And it has been published. If you want uh, all the methodological details, you have that paper over there um, that was published in 2020. And we have several others that we can share. And uh, the system has been so successful, has been operational since the end of 2019. Operational means that every month you get a real forecast for the next three months. So this is not just a paper. It's something that we have there um, you know, uh, active uh, and has been running for a few years now. Um, and we want to upgrade that with Rachel's uh, um, uh, team and, you know, a lot of interactions that are happening uh, right now to, to expand into Europe. But let me let me show you what this is. So AEDES is this AEDES Born Disease Environmental Suitability Monitoring and Prediction System. It's a climate service, so it's supposed to serve, it's supposed to help decision makers to make the best decisions possible. So the interface, the interface, sorry, we'll play a little bit with, with that. Uh, we'll have like a map showing some colors that are related to the particular number, the particular variable that PAHO WHO, the World, World Health Organization, asked us to use. It's not dengue cases, it's not temperature, it's not rainfall. They wanted this R0, which is the same type of uh, variable number that was used during the COVID time uh, to make predictions. So it's very similar to that, you know, like methodological approach. And you will see that there is also, a, you know, like information in context. What does this prediction mean? We will play with that in a little bit and it will be, you know, these, these lines and, and, you know, that you're seeing over there. So, but let me advance. So as you can imagine, it has, um, you know, this is a very complex problem because you need on one side to pay attention to everything that is happening in terms of climate not only El Nino, because El Nino is very important, but it's not the only player. Imagine that climate is a symphony and you have multiple instruments playing that symphony. Climate change is one or a set of instruments in your, in your orchestra. And then you have El Nino, and then you have things happening in the, in the Atlantic Ocean, in different regions of the Atlantic Ocean and also over land. So we need to pay attention to, in order to capture and listen to the music, probably you all, or most of you already uh, watched this movie Oppenheimer, and there is this question of, do you hear, can you hear the music? We hear the music, and the music is not only coming from El Nino. So, because it's so complicated, not only in terms of climate, but also when you include the presence of the mosquitoes, the, the, it, to know if the, the disease is circulating or not, and then to try to say something about the environmental conditions that are an envelope for it all, the thing is really complicated. 
Okay, but we found that if we focus on environmental suitability, which is uh, the goal of you know the forecast system of um, what IAD is going to be forecasting is going to be related to environmental suitability, we were able to um, satisfy uh, the demand coming from um, the decision maker in this uh, case, uh, PAHO. So um, uh, you're going to see this map later. You know the way we define our not. Some of you probably already know about that but is as the number of, of uh, cases or secondary cases from each primary case. And this will be, you know, the traditional definition of our not. And although it's not, um, you know, it's very uh, theoretical, it actually has been used to develop these protocols that I had mentioned. So basically, you know, our not is giving us a measure. Some people say it's a measure of the risk. Because depending on that number, I will have an idea of how many secondary or tertiary or whatever the generation is cases I'm going to get from each one of the original ones that was, uh, um, I don't know, put into a community that is assumed, this is why I, I say it's theoretical because it's not true, is assumed to be completely susceptible to that disease. So how this works? Because no model is perfect, we use a multimodal ensemble. What that means is that we use a different echo epidemiological or end epidemiological models to assess or not. So each one has its own pros and cons. Nothing is perfect because as we all know, life is hard. So we use four of these well-tested, well-known in the literature, like um, robust model for the end epidemiological component of what we want to do. Remember the different boxes that I just showed you? And we have a combination of those four models that we call a multimodal ensemble. But that those models will need not only endoepidemiological uh, information, will also need environmental information. So when we feed those models with observations, we have a monitoring system. When we feed those models with forecasts, we have a forecast system. So we need to be very aware of how to do this. And because no model is perfect, we'll need to do a lot of these calibration corrections that Rachel was mentioning uh, a few minutes ago. So once you have that, you have at the same time a monitoring system and a prediction system that is consistent because we're using basically apples and apples um, to, to be able to say things about that. So it's actually what is called in the literature a uh, super ensemble because we have multiple climate models being fed into multiple entropological models. So at the end of the day, we needed to work with uh, more than 4,500 of these simulations in order to assess how good that is. So we learned that actually using multiple models is important. What you can see here on the left, this is a, you know, it's a metric to assess how good the model is. The redder, the closer to 100, the better. If we use any model, just one model, any model of those, it will be this good. Once we combine all of them, we get the best of, of every single one and we get increased um, predictive capacity. You will hear that here and there as a skill. When we say a skill is how good a model predicts something with respect to something. That something is measured by this particular metric here, but that's not important. The important thing is that PAHO told us that we needed to give them uh, the expected value of R0. Okay, this is what uh, for a particular um, season was observed. It's, this is coming from the paper. Um, so I don't remember if this was 2000, I don't know, 18 or something like that, whatever the, that was. And this is what happened. But something important was this discussion about nothing is perfect. We give, will give you the expected value for each location and an error bar. That error bar is here um, plotted in this additional map. So the way you understand this is that you need to get the actual value plus minus this map. There is no way we can only give you this because no forecast is perfect, okay? So we assessed that for multiple years and to see how good the model is. And we found that the model was better in this particular season than in that other season, that it was better in this particular location than in that other one. And all that has been reported in that paper. So. If you want to see the details, we can talk about that later or read the paper. But the other important thing is that they wanted all ranges of possible thresholds in their protocols. There was no way for us to only give the median or the mean because they had something like, if this is particular location and I exceed three, an R0 of 3.2, 
you know, I, I should do this or I should do that. So you see here, this is the demand. They say 3.2. The blue one is what typically happens on average for 30 years. So 3.2 is exceeded for that particular location 60% of the times. And in that particular forecast, 3.2, uh, that magical number that triggers this set of actions, but not this other one, was like the probability of, of exceeding that threshold was very high. And these are those two locations. Uh, in D, we have New York, and in C, we have Miami. And you can see that simultaneously that provided uh, information to decision makers to see, to PAHO in this case, to see you know, how, what to expect, not only uh, you know, to follow the protocol, but also to tr be able to translate that in terms of um, people that needed to, be, to go to this location and not that one, because the forecast system was suggesting to, to be, um, that location would be worse. I'm going to stop here with my slides so I can, I don't know if I still have like at least uh, two or three more minutes. Uh, if not, just uh, let me know. But this is how it looks like the latest forecast that has been produced by the system this month. So it's October 2023. We already produced November, December 2023. Uh, sorry, this is January 2024. This is a mistake that I'm going to fix right now. Apologies. Good. Nothing happened. So November 2023, December 2023, and January 2024. And again, what we're seeing here is going to be for one particular location that you can see there in that red dot that is in Colombia. Probably we have some Colombian people here, Barranquilla, Barranquilla. And we have what has been, what is the typical behavior in terms of rainfall, frequency of rainfall, frequency of rainy days, temperature, the average, the maximum and the minimum and the range, because all these were uh, requested by the decision maker by PAHO as important information. For example, if uh, you know we know that th this season usually rains a lot, do not do the fumigation, the vector control with chemicals because the rain will clean everything and then you will need to do it again. So all that was considered. And this is these are not this environmental suitability. In bars, you have what usually happens. You know that means average of the last thirty years. And in black, what has been happening this particular year and what we expect to have. Do I have two minutes? I'm still in the minutes. <clears throat> so this is the interface, okay? So I will- Este, si puedes uh, hablar un poco más, Ángel, si es que... Uh, no you, you can, you can, you do have a few more minutes if you want to. Solo por, por mostrar... Um... Great, awesome. Just to, I wanted to show how it works. Just to be consistent, I'm going to go back to English. So I have been granted uh, uh, three more minutes or whatever that is. So this is a map because as I said before, you as the minister of health in a particular country might want to know where to focus your money, your attention for the next three months, okay? See, this is April. Why I'm doing this? To show you how good the system is. The black line is Anka. what- we... Oh, yes. Sorry, Anka, we can't see the map. We can just see your summary slide. Oh, okay, thank you. Uh, what about now? Yes? Great, thank you. Oh yeah, thank you so much. I was like, you know, talking to, <laughs> to myself, sorry. Okay, so this is a map showing you the distribution of the forecast of the expected value of that magical number that they use for the protocols. If that is dengue cases, you use dengue cases. If that is temperature square minus precipitation divided by relative humidity, that's what you need to do. Okay. In this case, they wanted R0, which is the same quantity that we also use for COVID. This is not a COVID model. This is a uh, iris bone disease uh, set of models. Okay. So we see that re re regions in red and even like purple or pink uh, should require more attention from the authorities, from the decision makers. And I'm saying that this one is uh, here in, for April 2023, because I want you to see how the forecast, which is here in red, probably you can see my, my mouse right now, my cursor. And, and remember, black is what happened this year. So let's see how good our forecast for this particular location in Barranqui Barranquilla, sorry, has been. So that was April. So then that's May. Okay, that is um, June. So let me go back. You can see that the red line is not exactly on top of the of the observation, but is is uh, you know is pretty much like over there, like in this case. Remember that these are seasonal forecasts, so this is a three month. So you were comparing like the middle, um, 
it, what you're seeing here is a monthly is the observation at monthly time scale. So we we are not comparing like three months and three months. You know that will be a, a fair comparison, and then it will be even closer, even better. But the red line is actually following that. So for details on the evaluation of the model, uh, let's talk later or read the paper. And what is happening now? So this is what we have we had in August, September, and this is our latest forecast for October. Dun 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 dun. So. You know, this line is now shorter because the other extreme is on, on next year, it's in on January 2024. So that's why the size is a little bit different. But this is what happened, what, what we expect for this particular location, Barranquilla. And with that, they can say, oh, so it's exceeding or not the threshold in my protocol. This is what I need to do now or not. And you can zoom out. And you have the entire, well, this is a particular domain uh, that uh, since NOAA funded this project, uh, they wanted to see um, this particular region because that, you know, that's of interest for the U.S., but also for when people want to do vacations uh, near the U.S. So they call that the transboundary region. But let me show you a couple of extra things. They wanted for us to produce uh, information about the exposure. So where is the population? So the map room also has that information. You have information about the hazard, you know, the R0, the dengue, but also about where people is. Because if this location over here is super red, but no one is living there, so then I can relax. So there is information about exposure. There is information about vulnerability. They said, following some studies from the CIA, that infant mortality rate is a robust measure of vulnerability, even for disease, you know, for basically a lot of multiple variables, but in particular for diseases like the ones we were interested. Okay, so you have here infant mortality rate, and you also can see uh, precipitation and forecast predictions, if that's what you wanted, they consider that useful, but also this is the monitor. This is, remember that I told you, don't tell me that it's not going to load, uh, remember that I told you that we can uh, get observed um, data in the system. So this is what has been happening. You know, I can do something crazy here, something like the 2000 or actually 2020. And it will load with observations. Tell me yes, tell me yes. Um, let's do it. Why are you shy? Um, and it will load into the system the observations and show me like the evolution. I will be able to see that August tends to be you know, like warming in the north, so then I have more environmental suitability for those diseases over there. Okay, so what is going on right now? Now when I need you, you are not going to appear. So, um, you know, right now it's computing. Oh yeah, so it's, it's just being shy, 2010. So this helps to provide context. If I tell you it's gonna rain 200 millimeters tomorrow, that means absolutely nothing until I tell you Typically, it rains 100, or typically it rains two millimeters. So 200 is the end of the world. I always need context, and this is designed to provide that context, okay? So I'm gonna stop there. There are a lot of other things that we might be able to do uh, that is related to um, this plot that I mentioned. Let me just go back to forecast um, and to the last, the last one that we had, which was, I think, Barranquilla. Um, Fundamentality rate. I think it was this one. So see, here at the end, we have that plot for Barranquilla. This is was produced in October for November, December 2023, January 2024. And you select the demand, you select the threshold for your protocol, and then it tells you what is the probability. Blue is the average from the last 30 years. For example, 3.6 usually has not happened. And now because of climate change and natural uh, climate variability, you know, because of this influence between climate change and everything else in the climate symphony that is not climate change, that is there, that is natural, we see that now those probabilities have been enhanced. And 3.6 now was 0% and now it's 10%. So this is, this is uh, you know, already a lot. Um, and I'm going to stop there because I imagine that you have tons of questions. Thank you very much. And, um, and this is it. Oh, everyone fell asleep. No, Rachel is 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 awake. Good. Yeah. We have more people awake. <laughs>
Bueno, muchas gracias, Ángel, por tu presentación. Well, thank you so much, Ángel, for your presentation. It was quite informative and highlighting the relevance of the models and what uh, you have been working on. I also like that uh, it's also taken into account that these are probabilities, that there's a margin for error, but this is very useful to, to use for forecasts in the region. And also the ADIS project is, is so interesting uh, I would like to, to review and, and read more upon, on it. Well, I would like to begin now with your questions. I'm going to begin with Rachel. Right now, I'm going to switch to English. And you know you have interpreting interpretation with the button, button at the bottom of the page. Is the epidemic channel different among countries and um, between the North and South Hemisphere? Yeah, so usually each um, disease surveillance team calculate their own endemic channel based on the data observed in, in their, their place of interest. So it could be at the country level or region level or even city level. So it's usually just calculated using the previous five years of data, um, sometimes longer, some places use um, 10 years. And often a, a bit of a qualitative decision is made when trying to calculate um, outbreak thresholds, often by eye, outbreak years are removed. And then um, some kind of threshold is determined using maybe the mean or uh, mean plus two standard deviation. So it's very uh, place specific. Okay, okay, thank you. Well, here's a more local question is uh, for the Peru region. How useful is a citizen science in alerting the presence of mosquitoes or sharing mosquitoes-borne diseases? What is rea the reality of this region? Can citizen science help to combat these diseases? What barriers may exist to this? How well people are well educated to combat, to combat these uh, diseases? In Peru, it seems that this is not happening or is not happening as intensely as this should. Yeah, I think citizen science can be an incredibly useful tool for many aspects of uh, trying to control diseases in, in, in terms of identifying mosquitoes. I, I've seen examples of it being particularly useful in emerging settings, uh, being able to use citizen science to detect um, invasive mosquito species or a change in a particular species. Um, we've been working with um, collaborators on a, a project called Mosquito Alert, um, which initially focused on the um, what's known as the tiger mosquito in Europe, which is the Aedes albopictus mosquito. But through this app, um, you're able to, uh, through photos, detect different species. So this is like capable of uh, detecting introductions of Aedes um, aegypti, for example, into Europe. Um, so it could also be um, very useful in, in situations where, um, you know, the mosquitoes are present all year round, potentially. Um, I guess, yeah, it's utility and where you have, um, where it's ubiquitous in the environment may be less clear, but certainly using citizen science for, for any other aspect of um, sort of reporting uh, symptoms or reporting um, breeding sites. I think these tools are incredibly useful when you're trying to really get sort of granular fine scale information and trying to target resources on a very um, local level. So I think for certainly a lot of scope to incorporate citizen science in, in these kind of um, decision support tools. Okay, good, good information. Thank you. Uh, the next one is in reference to clinical symptoms of dengue and leptoriosis, many times only the laboratory test for dengue is done, leaving aside the test of leptoriosis. Therefore, many cases remain in a situation of probably dengue. What is the probability of confirming the clinical symptoms of leptoriosis and requesting the laboratory test for leptoriosis? Can a patient have both diseases at the same time? Uh, yeah, uh, well, it is possible to have co-infection with both. Um, so the lepto data does need to be uh, laboratory confirmed, but there's also uh, many times dengue is also confirmed based on um, 
sort of clinical presentations rather than laboratory. So you can get um, misreporting in both directions. Um, so I, I, in areas where leptospirosis is particularly prevalent, for example, in areas um, with lots of agricultural work or flooding, then potentially the, um, the health services may be more aware to conduct a test for leptospirosis. But um, I imagine there's a lot, I don't have the statistics to hand, but I imagine there's a, a lot of uh, misreporting between the two diseases. Okay, well, that remarks uh, the importance of a well-trained uh, health uh, system for, for identifying this. Um, well, I think, um, uh, are there any studies on the impact of pregnant women affected by dengue, malaria? What measures to take for this? Uh, that's not really my area of expertise, but I, there certainly is a lot of literature looking at uh, pregnant uh, women of a definitely very vulnerable uh, group when it comes to um, infection with malaria or dengue. There's certainly been a lot of research looking at this um, for Zika infections as well, um, but I don't really have much more information on that at the moment. Well, okay. Well, thank you, Rachel. I will jump now with Anke. Okay. May I add something to that one? Yes, sure. Yeah, so this is very, very important, especially in terms of even some other uh, forecasts that we have for undernutrition in Central America, because, um, you know, as we all know, um, it's very, very important that the iron levels in pregnant woman, women are at the, you know, are within a particular range. And diseases like malaria or dengue are, are key because it might like lower their iron levels. And although it's not very common and there is no in general way to be worried about this, uh, in, in there have been reports on, in some cases, uh, death by a combination of factor involved in the person having malaria or dengue. So again, as as Rachel said, you know, this is this is this is not my area of expertise, but we did some work about it uh, relating, um, you know, this compound um, hazards, health hazards involving undernutrition and dengue and even like it, it impacts it's very important in developing countries for example in central america because a lot of people a lot of women won't go to the fields uh, and that will impact even like the um the agricultural activity in, in those countries so it's a very interesting case of compound hazards that still needs to be uh, further investigated good thank you thank you for your response Rachel, I have another question for you. <laughs> uh, how did the model discriminate the expansion of dengue due to the behavior of meteorological variables of transmission due to the mobility of sick people? In recent years, there has been a very significant increase in the migration of people from tropical regions to mid latitudes. Many of these people arrive with illnesses. Well, in the terms of the work that we were doing in Brazil, we were looking at um, sort of erosion, if you like, of these diffusion barriers. Uh, so looking at things like um, the length of the transmission season, also connectivity between different places and the role of different um, urban centres. So whether you're in a metropolis compared to a, um, a regional capital and how connected those areas were. And we found that um, a combination of factors, including um, more months in the year with suitable temperatures, uh, being sort of connected to a regional center, um, having experienced an outbreak in the previous years were indicators to, uh, to show the expansion of, of the dengue transmission zone into lower latitudes and also um, higher altitudes. Um, in terms of sort of, um, sort of international travel and um, expansion into uh, previously unaffected areas. Um, there's certainly um, many uh, efforts to try and understand how connected, for example, places in Europe are with areas experiencing um, endemic um, diseases and being, being able to connect data on uh, travel medicine and report imported cases um, with the prevalence of mosquitoes and tr trying to combine these different um, sources of information so that um, the public services are aware when there is an increase in imported cases, there is the uh, suitable conditions for the mosquito um, to be able to sort of deploy any um, prevention measures to make sure there's no onward transmission. Okay, so here's the last question. Um, how do you work with communities to, to share the risk and prevention measures? 
Well, particularly in um, the project uh, that I mentioned called Harmonize, we have um, a community engagement um, component of that project uh, where we're working with different um, community members in the hotspots we're working. So particularly in the Brazilian Amazon, in the Colombian Andes, and also um, in rural and urban areas in the Peruvian Amazon. And we're working with local community groups to really understand the perceptions about how um, climate variation, climate change has been um, impacting sort of changes in um, the uh, epidemiology and outbreaks of different diseases over the years. And uh, to think about different um, adaptation measures that can be um, adopted to try and build resilience. And also to make sure that um, in those communities, they um, feel comfortable having novel technologies or things like drones in their environments to collect data and to make sure that um, there's sort of a mutual understanding on how um, this kind of data can be used to serve the needs of the local communities. Good. Thank you. Thank you, Farah. Well, now I will jump uh, with Angel. Uh, well, we have uh, yeah, a few questions. <laughs> so for Latin America, uh, this, this comes from Latin America. In the areas of Latin America with droughts, uh, but due to heavy rains upstream in other areas within the same basin, flooding occurs downstream hundreds of kilometers away. Right now, flooding is occurring in urban areas of Uruguay due to rain that occurred in the south of Brazil. The increase in dangers, risk, and vulnerability is evident. However, this situation has left out of the climate and health predictions since flooding has not been contemplated. Wouldn't it be convenient to include flood uh, models in the multimodal combination? Yeah, I'm on mute. No, yeah, very good question. Uh, thank you, actually, for a, you know a very detailed uh, background for your question. Yeah, that will be uh, of interest. Um, I'm going to say actually that that is related to the, the, the threshold question that we were, um, discussing before. So, so, you know, at the end, you are talking about particular thresholds that are extreme for extreme rainfall events and also related to floods. And there are obviously multiple types of flood, fast floods against like more like low, mo slow motion of floods. And those thresholds need to be considered as an input when we are like uh, doing our models and our forecasts. So I completely agree with you, uh, especially in those locations you are discussing. So yes, thank you for the questions. And I, my short answer is yes. <laughs> okay, well, here's the, the next question. Um, no, let me see, I'm sorry. No worries. I think, um, Mm, I think maybe we can switch to Spanish, it's fine. Yeah, whatever, lo que sea está bien y he respondido un montón en yes. el chat. Yes, I've answered too many questions in the chat, so if I, I don't have more questions from you, I won't cry. Okay, we'll go back to Spanish then. The tool you presented, Angel, is it being used in re in uh, countries in the region, how how much is it being used? This question comes from Peru. It's mainly used. Let me just share something with you so you can understand this in uh, with more context. So the geographic domain that was covered is this one. As you can see, Latin America and the Caribbean, we have this area. So the issue with this is that we I've been asked in the chat, for example, for Peru, what um, what do we have? At the moment, this is what we have. And that's because of the definition of the initial project. So it's mainly being used in this region. And it's being used by the uh, by PAHO. And this is very important because Pajo said that they are the ruling entity for meteorological matters. So they wanted to do the translation of that information that can be quite technical for the general public. And they wanted to upload that information into their bulletins. So Pajo is using that information. Anna Rivière Cinnamon, a 
from Bajo, who's a co-leader of this process. She's now the chief of the Bajo office in Panama. So they're using this information at that level, at the general office level, and also in Washington. So as I was also mentioning in the chat, they're interested in having a second version with some methodology improvements and other mo models that cover the entire Latin America. So the, the question whether it's been used in other countries in South America besides Colombia, as far as I know, it's not being used outside of Pajo. And in Colombia, besides Pajo, there is the Health Institute that is also using the tool. And as far as I know, it's also being used in Panama. No, Rachel está ahí, así que vale. I see, Rachel, something happened. Jose Martin says, thank you for the question. And I, thank you. The Pajo contact point in Panama is Ana, Ana Riviere Cinema. I'm going to, going to write it down. I'm also answering a, a question in the chat about the forecast capacity. We could link this to another question, whether it, there are enfermedades de vectores en América Latina. It's a big question. Yes, there are. That is why we have vector control activities, and that's why we have this continuous surveillance efforts. So the short answer would be yes, of course, we have protocols. In some areas, they are more efficient than in others. In some countries, there's less harmonized contexts. In some countries, depending on the state or province, however you call it, there is a different surveillance system, which is interesting. And also in some regions in the Caribbean, each island has its own surveillance system, but the protocols exist. We could link that to two questions uh, that we can merge it into one. In the model, are you considering the fact that there is more resistance of dengue mosquitoes to fumigation? I don't know if that is a question for me or Rachel, because we work with a cocktail of models, but the one we use in ADIS doesn't include that type of intervention. It's something that we would like to explore in the future. We're going to do an upgrade to version two that will improve some key aspects that will involve la versión posterior es que pudiéramos incluir este tipo de intervenciones que son fundamentales y y si me permite son fundamentales porque and uh, there are these factors that are very good as they introduce a loop that is important for the modeling For example, if we say this is going to occur, if someone intervenes or takes action, there is going to be a change in the result. So that is something that is very hard to model. It's easier always to do modeling about the past, post-mortem, of course, that predicting the future. I don't know if that helps ans to answer the question. Another question is, are there forecasts for Brazil specifically for the south of Brazil. As I was explaining in the chat, we're going to focus a focus that is more concentrated on the Caribbean. 
For that, we would have the south of Europe, parts of Africa, and southeast of Asia. So it's going to be bigger. So un until Africa and Europe are um, more in shape, I would say that uh, it, things shouldn't take too long. In the model, do you use biological parameters besides meteorological parameters? Yes, if you remember, I'm going, let me show you this. This part in green that talks about meteorological aspects, well, this has a lot to do with uh, several vectors, well, mosquitoes. It has to do with information closely related to the disease and interaction with humans. Those are models created by research institutions that are going to be tested. Those are models that include all these interactions. And of course, we have these entoepidemiological factors. Thank you for that answer. And now I'm going to switch into Spanish or into English. This will be a question for both of you. Uh, Rachel, too, please, if you can uh, reply something. How to understand these relationships between climate and vectors? What has been weakened and strengthened in the life chain of the actors involved, human beings and vectors? I think that you know, information we can get about the climate in terms of um, uh, climate variability, extreme events and, and climate change, they have different impacts on the pathogens, um, the hosts and um, the vectors. So it's really, we need to sort of understand how um, both the climate changes human behavior, how it also changes um, the biology of, of the vectors and also interactions between the vectors, the pathogens and the host. So that's why we're trying to um, move towards the, trying to understand this in this integrated One Health framework so we can incorporate different sources of data to understand how um, climate is impacting all different aspects of, of health and the transmission of these diseases. Okay. I completely agree with Rachel. I, I, I can, yeah, I don't. I don't think I can. So it's very important that we are aware of the complexities and how difficult it is, even as I mentioned before, to monitor, to you know, like address, to have like good surveillance systems, and and even like more complicated, like to have a good forecast. But a lot of effort is invested in having information that, although is not perfect is actionable. That's what we are aiming at. We are not aiming at perfection. We're aiming at something that is really good so you can have the best decision possible. If we aim at perfection, we will never actually get there. And, and with everything that is happening, not only regarding climate, but even like this global world and a lot of socioeconomic variables, you know, there are a lot of components that are not predictable. So I completely agree with, with Rachel. Okay, well, thank you very much. Thank you very much for your presentations. This information here is very helpful for the region. And we also appreciate the presence of our participants here. So we will finish this session. Thank you very much, all of you. And well, I would like to remember uh, the participants that we will have, uh, we will reply actually uh, the rest of questions in the website. So you will have the material to download them. And well, thank you very much for all of you. Thank you. Thank you. Have a nice day. Thank you. Yeah.